Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everybody, today I am Dr. Shantanu Kumar Tripathi, I will be speaking on an area about the drugs that are used in obstetric practice. Obstetrics is a discipline that is involved with care for the pregnant mothers and uh, childbirth. So, there are certain this group of drugs that I will be discussing today, uh, they are used in in pregnancy and labor, late pregnancy and labor and also some of the complications of pregnancy and labor. Basically their action is mediated through their effects on the uterus, the gravid uterus, the pregnant uterus. So, uterus as you know is the organ, female reproductive organ that is meant for holding the developing fetus providing space for the fetus to develop and at the time when the fetus is enough mature in the through the entire period of pregnancy the all the 40 weeks of gestational period at the end when the fetus is matured there is no further need for the matured fetus to be kept in the uterus so the fetus is to be expelled and nature has provided or there is physiological system inbuilt whereby the uterus then contracts thereby the fetus is delivered, the baby is delivered at the end of the pregnancy. And this total period of maturity takes 40 weeks and uh, that is the entire period of pregnancy. Now, because of some pathology, because of some problems there might be premature contraction of the uterus, the gravid uterus whereby even before the fetus is enough mature, the uterus will contract and will try to expel the fetus. So, that is not good for the health of the newborn. So, it can actually induce premature or preterm uh, labor or childbirth. So, that is something which needs to be avoided and there are certain drugs which help in preventing preterm birth or preterm labor. On the other hand, there are some kinds of uh, some complications of pregnancy or some complications of labor rather, <coughs> whereby there is a bleeding from the uterus. Now, the bleeding before the child is delivered is called antipartum bleeding and the bleeding after the child is delivered, it is called postpartum bleeding. After the child is delivered, the placenta needs to be also delivered and if there is some bits of placenta remains as a leftover in the uterus, that can also lead to inadequate contraction of the uterus and thereby there might be bleeding. In case of postpartum hemorrhage, that is the bleeding that occurs, uterine bleeding that occurs after the delivery of the child that is postpartum hemorrhage that is dangerous for the mother and it can be fatal, it can also take the life of the mother. So, it needs to be, it is an emergency, it is an obstetric emergency that needs to be also treated expeditiously. And so, we need to use drugs which can also induce uterine contraction and thereby it can stop that bleeding. On the other hand, <coughs> so basically then we are trying to discuss drugs that can either stimulate contraction, uterine contraction in certain clinical setting, in clinical situations and also there are certain other drugs which will be preventing uterine contraction rather it will be causing relaxation of the uterus or uterine smooth muscles, the myometrium. So, these are the two broad groups of drugs that we will be discussing today. The first group that stimulates uterine contraction we call them uterotonic drugs. 
and the drugs that cause uterine relaxation we call them tocolytics or uterine relaxant or uterine relaxing drugs. So, first we will be discussing the tocolytics. The tocolytics are also called uterine relaxants or the labor suppressants. That means, if there is a tendency towards premature labor that will be suppressed, so that the labor can continue further and thereby allowing the developing fetus to mature enough when it can be then delivered. So, the purpose of these tocolytics would be uh, a temporary not very long lasting effect. So, it has to be very controlled only for the duration when it needs to be held back in the uterus it will continue and when the drug will be withdrawn then the natural physiological uterine contraction should be coming back. So, it has to be a reversible action of these agents labor suppressants because we cannot keep on suppressing the labor for good. So, the after some time when the drug is withdrawn the labor should take place. Now, these drugs are used actually to prevent premature labor and when we talk of premature we mean before the end of 37 weeks of pregnancy. So, anything that happens before that before the end of 37 weeks we will call it premature labor and we need to avoid this and in order to avoid this we will continue we will allow the labor to continue beyond this end of uh, 37 weeks towards 40 weeks. So, it should be we should these uh, 2 or 3 weeks are very critical in the development of the fetus particularly when you talk of lung maturity it is very important for the fetus. So, suppression of uterine contraction is partial it, it is controlled and regulated <coughs> delaying the birth of for several days only <coughs> only several days thereby allowing the fetus to mature adequately. Depending on the different tocolytics that can be used the mother and the fetus would require intensive monitoring particularly in reference to the blood pressure monitoring the cardiotocography that means, how the uh, fetus <coughs> cardiac activity is going on uh, cardiotocography is a technique by which the fetal heart is heart activity is monitored. Now, there are only few types of drugs the to different tocolytic agents uh, the possibly the most commonly used one is the selective beta 2 adrenergic agonists adrenergic receptor agonists that is tabutalin, ritodrine, isoxuprine, tabutalin, salbutamol these kinds of drugs are otherwise used in uh, asthma also as bronchodilators because because simply because these beta 2 adrenergic receptors are located in the respiratory tract it is they are also located in the uterus, uterus smooth muscles. Now, <coughs> tarbutalin, ritodrine and isoxuprine these drugs they are used as tocolytics. The second group of drug that we will be discussing is calcium channel blockers. In this group again uh, we have good experience with one molecule and that is nifedipine. The third group is a directly acting agents that is magnesium sulphate. We have heard of this magnesium sulphate in uh, for the treatment of eclampsia and preeclampsia and the same magnesium sulphate it is also a relaxant smooth muscle relaxant effect. So, magnesium sulphate uh, can be used as tocolytic. The fourth group is oxytocin antagonist oxytocin receptor antagonist oxytocin is a hormone posterior pituitary hormone from the posterior pituitary there are two hormones that are liberated one is oxytocin the other is the antidiuretic hormone vasopressin. <coughs> now, oxytocin from the name uh, as it suggests it, it also it, it is a natural uterine uh, contraction producing agent <coughs> it is a naturally occurring agent it is a hormone and its purpose is actually to, to facilitate labor. So, at the time when the uh, pregnancy approaches towards the end of these 40 weeks oxytocin receptors will be sensitized and oxytocin is liberated and that oxytocin will help in natural it is a natural process physiological process help in uh, contraction of the, uh, the, the uh, uterus gravid uterus which will be producing expulsion of 
the fetus. Now, sometimes even before the uh, the maturity is achieved by the fetus before that 37 weeks end of 37 weeks premature uh, tendency towards premature expulsion of the fetus uh, oxytocin may be active and we need to block the action of oxytocin and that is how it is done by using a drug called uh, atosiban uh, and that is it should be rather atosiban and uh, that is actually a drug that blocks oxytocin receptor and thereby the oxytocin naturally occurring oxytocin or the hormone will be prevented from producing its action. The fifth group is prostaglandin synthesis inhibitor and under this group mainly the most experience has been uh, achieved, has been obtained with one drug and that is indomethacin. Besides indomethacin other drugs other non steroidal anti inflammatory drug like ibuprofen has also been used, but more commonly indomethacin has been used. So, we will be discussing a little bit about these five groups of drugs. First to start with the selective beta 2 agonists and they actually bind to the uterine beta 2 adrenergic receptors <coughs> the membrane receptors and then the post membrane sequence of event starts the, the uh, drug will then activate the adenylyl cyclase or the drug receptor combination will stimulate induce activation of adenylyl cyclase and there will be increase in the cellular cyclic AMP level which in its turn will activate the cyclic AMP dependent protein kinase uh, will be activated and that would reduce the intracellular calcium concentration. And this calcium otherwise is responsible for uh, smooth muscle contraction in the uterus myometrium contraction. So, if the, con if the intracellular calcium concentration goes down, so there will be relaxation of the myometrium that is how the selective beta 2 agonists like ritodrine like uh, tarbutaline they will act. Ritodrine or tarbutaline is administered in a controlled intravenous infusion with supervision and monitoring of efficacy. When you talk of efficacy we actually mean suppression of contractions as well as monitoring of appearance of early signs of maternal and fetal adverse drug reactions. So, as soon as there is appearance of adverse drug reaction we need to stop the infusion or slow the uh, rate of infusion like that or and after uh, the initial um, infusion controlled infusion we can switch to oral for maintenance therapy. The, the maternal side effects or the maternal adverse effects include the nausea palpitation this palpitation tachycardia they can be explained by the, um, the residual beta 1 uh, agonistic property although we say they are selective they are not absolutely selective there will be some um, residual beta 1 effects will also there. So, because of that we can explain this palpitation or tachycardia and at the extreme if there is overdoses it can also cause cardiac arrhythmia and it can be fatal too. Besides there could be tremor there could be hypotension and hypotension can also be explained by beta 2 agonistic activity tremor is also by the beta 2 agonistic activity then there could be hypokalemia and hyperglycemia uh, and I have al already spoken about cardiac arrhythmia with high dose. So, that can happen. So, it is a fatal reaction cardiac arrhythmia. So, in all these situations whenever there is a tendency towards appearance of these signs one has to stop infusion or reduce the dose etcetera. On the other hand so far as the fetal intolerance is concerned there could be fetal tachycardia, there is hyperinsulinemia, there could be hypoglycemia and there could be myocardial and septal hypertrophy, myocardial ischemia, so etcetera. So, one has to be cautious about uh, these safety concerns and accordingly the treatment has to be properly monitored. Going to the next group that is nifedipine, one advantage of nifedipine is it is otherwise uh, very uh, e administration is very easy it is given orally. So, nifedipine is a uh, uh, calcium channel blocker that precisely would block the voltage dependent L type of calcium channels and thereby it will impair the calcium entry into the myocardial cells and thereby because of low availability of calcium within the cell there will be contractions will not happen. 
there will be suppression of contractions. So, nifedipine is used for prophylaxis of uh, recurrent premature labor and uh, when it is given orally, uh, it is given actually 10 milligram every 30 minutes until contractions subside followed by 10 milligram 4 times a day. Frequency of administration is also regulated with warning signs of maternal side effects like light, light headedness, flushing, nausea, tachycardia and hypotension. But otherwise overall it has a good uh, safety profile and thereby uh, it, is, it is very much uh, preferred by many obstetricians. Going to the next group magnesium sulphate, it is otherwise a drug of choice in the treatment of preeclampsia or eclampsia. It is a direct relaxant of the myometrium, it is given by intravenous infusion and it effectively delays the preterm labor without or even with cervical changes. That means, even when the labor has been progressed and cervical effacement has started taking place, thinning of the cervix, cervical changes has started occurring even then if you start uh, magnesium sulphate there is uh, still optimum effect. Also the, to not to that extent when cervical changes has not started occurring. So, the better result should be before the uh, cervical ripening or before the cervical effacement, but even after the cervical effacement has started occurring, uh, magnesium sulphate treatment can also help in holding back labor or reducing the contractions. Magnesium sulphate is preferred by many due to its familiarity because we have su sufficient experience in using magnesium sulphate in eclampsia or preeclampsia and uh, it, it has ease of use and it has lack of serious ma maternal adverse drug reactions, safety profile is good otherwise. However, the minor side effects like feeling uh, hot flashes uh, and nausea, there could be blood vision, double vision or lethargy felt by the mother. Uh, so far as the neonates are concerned, there could be also lethargy, there could be hypotonicity and the APGAR score may be less than average or less than uh, normal. So, but then overall magnesium sulphate has a better safety profile as compared to the other drugs. Coming to indomethacin, indomethacin is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, it is a non-selective COX or cyclooxygenase inhibitor, both by non-selective we mean both the cyclooxygenase or COX-1 and the COX-2, COX-1 is the, is the constitutive COX and COX-2 is the inducive COX which happens during inflammation. Both COX-1 and COX-2 they are inhibited by indomethacin. As a result the prostaglandin E2 and prostaglandin F2 alpha synthesis are inhibited. Both this prostaglandin E2 and F2 alpha they otherwise causes myocardium myometrial contraction and the such contractions will be suppressed when you use indomethacin. However, indomethacin is not that safe as compared to the other tocolytics and the safety concerns would restrict use of indomethacin only to resistant cases, cases where other treatments have failed or contraindicated. <coughs> so, indomethacin is given orally 25 milligram twice a day for not more than 2 or 3 days. So, continuing indomethacin for more than 2 days or maximum more than 3 days that can cause lot of complications. We, we need to carefully monitor the maternal and fetal intolerance signs. Maternal side effects include dizziness, heartburn, nausea and bleeding. Indomethacin uh, as an NSAID it can cause bleeding also. Fetal adverse reactions are more serious and more uh, to be concerned about premature closure of ductus arteriosus. So, indomethacin particularly as it is given in the late pregnancy, the closure of the ductus arteriosus if it is prematurely closed. So, that is something particularly it can happen if you continue indomethacin more than 48 hours or 72 hours. Reduced volume of amniotic fluid is another uh, complication of indomethacin therapy. Jaundice in the newborn, necrotizing en enterocolitis intravenous hemorrhage or peri periventricular leukomalacia, these are some of the serious complications not although not very common, but uh, they are otherwise quite serious. So, thereby indomethacin we can think of using, but not very regularly only in select cases. And finally, this atosiban, uh, this is actually uh, oxytocin receptor antagonist, 
it is again given intravenously and uh, given in intravenous initially a bolus 6.75 milligram bolus over slowly over 60 seconds or 1 minute. This is to be followed immediately by continuous infusion of 300 microgram per minute for 3 hours followed by 100 microgram per min minute for up to 45 hours. Again you see it is not more than 2 days. So, all the all the uh, particularly in late pregnancy when we are using these tocolytics, all the tocolytic drugs, the general principle is do not go beyond uh, 48 hours. So, maximum total dose or duration is 330.75 milligram in 48 hours. No dose and that is one advantage, no dose adjustment is needed in hepatic or renal impairment. So, that is an advantage. However, we need to carefully monitor the maternal and fetal intolerance and how labor is progressing etcetera. Uh, maternal side effects would include nausea, vomiting, hot flush, hypotension, tachycardia, dizziness, headache, hyperglycemia. However, it appears to be little safe in the fetus. However, we need to have more experience. This is relatively a new addition in the list of tocolytics in our therapeutic armamentarium of uh, premature labor or preterm labor. So, more experience is warranted. So, these are the few uh, five groups of drugs or five types of uh, medications that are used as tocolytics in the treatment of preterm labor. And uh, if we if we summarize uh, the most commonly or most safely uh, the preferred agents are beta 2 agonists and the uh, nifedipine. And besides people also have good experience with uh, magnesium sulphate which is a parenteral preparation. Uh, both nifedipine and uh, beta 2 agonists they can be given orally, but uh, beta 2 agonist retodrine can also be given or tarbutalin can also be given parenterally. Uh, NSAID indomethacin or maybe ibuprofen uh, is not really a fast choice can be used in resistant cases. Atosiban is we have relatively less experience, we need to generate more experience. Besides we have of course, the uh, the magnesium sulphate that we have already spoken about. So, these are the five types of drugs and then we will be having discussion on the uh, uterotonics, uterotonic agents which that is uterine stimulants uh, in another session. Thank you very much. If there are questions, we can address them. Thank you.